From 1926 to 1932, the Lake Harbor Bible Conference flourished under the leadership of its founder, Paul Rader. But due to the financial depression of the 30s and his failing health, Rader ceased operating the conference after the 1932 season. But the summer conferences continued under the sponsorship of local churches and pastors, including the First Baptist Church of Pontiac, Michigan, and its pastor, Dr. Henry Savage. A new era was about to unfold. Henry Harold Savage was born in Blair, Nebraska on July 23, 1887. And at the age of seven, the family moved to a Colorado homestead. He graduated from high school in 1905, then continued his education at Denver University, and later graduated from the University of Colorado with a master's degree in engineering. His goal was to be a civil engineer. But God had a different plan. During his senior year at the university, he attended a Billy Sunday meeting in Boulder, Colorado. He was confronted with his need for Christ and, a few weeks later, invited Christ into his life at a group Bible study. His desire to be an effective Christian layman soon prompted him to enroll at Moody Bible Institute for one year, but with no thought of entering the ministry. In 1911, the year of Henry's enrollment at Moody, a small Baptist church in Barron, Wisconsin was looking for a pastor. The church contacted Moody requesting a student to fill the pulpit. Henry was asked to fulfill that request. He preached one sermon in that church and the church promptly gave him a call to become their pastor. But there was more. A young, attractive church organist named Bessie Jensen had caught his attention. Bessie's father, who was the church clerk, dictated to Bessie the official letter calling Henry to the church. For the rest of his life, he would jokingly say, my future wife called me into ministry. They were married the same year. In 1923, he accepted a call to become the pastor of First Baptist Church in Pontiac, Michigan, the church he would lead for the next 38 years. Through those years, the church would grow and prosper and his counsel and leadership was sought after by many parachurch organizations. In addition to maintaining a popular radio broadcast, he served on the board of directors of HCJB, the Ukrainian General Mission, Hiawatha Land Indian Mission, National Association of Evangelicals, National Religious Broadcasters, Detroit Bible Institute, and the National Sunday School Association. Dr. Savage first came to the Lake Harbor Conference Grounds in 1934 for a week of meetings sponsored by the Pontiac Church. He immediately sensed that this was the place he had been looking for. The youth ministry of the church had grown dramatically, prompting a search for a suitable youth camp. And he had long desired a place where pastors, missionaries, and families could meet for spiritual growth and encouragement. In 1936, the church leased the conference grounds, and under the leadership of the church's new music and youth director, Howard Skinner, squeezed 500 boys into the facilities that were on the grounds. Savage was approached by Albert M. Johnson, the Chicago businessman who owned the grounds, and asked if he would consider purchasing the conference for the church's use. Savage signed a five-year lease and proceeded with a limited program the next summer with Howard Skinner as the temporary program director. He raised $40,000 toward the purchase of the property with additional funds contributed by the Sedan Interior Mission and Scripture Press of Wheaton, Illinois. In 1937, the conference was still called the Lake Harbor Bible Conference, and the abbreviated summer conference series was called Maranatha, which would later become the name of the conference grounds, Maranatha Bible Conference. By 1950, it would be called the Maranatha Bible and Missionary Conference. After two years of unofficial but hectic activity, the conference officially opened on July 3, 1938 with a full nine-week schedule. Dr. Savage's commitment to missions was evidenced both in his home and in the conference program. All three of the Savage children became foreign missionaries. 
Jim and his wife June served in Venezuela. Bob and his wife Gulda served in Ecuador along with his sister Helen and her husband Dick Broach. Many of the grandchildren would become missionaries as well. Along with a strong commitment to biblical teaching, missions became an integral component of the conference program. Mission organizations were featured each week, resulting in hundreds of people being called to missionary service and thousands of dollars being raised to support the various agencies and the needs of their work. It was to be a pattern that would continue to the present day. Dr. Savage is remembered as a home-loving man with a gentle and kind nature, but also a strong leader, a ready smile, and deep devotion to God. Upon his death in 1967 at the age of 80, the Savage family requested that all memorial gifts be used to construct a new prayer tower, replacing the old prayer tower where Dr. Savage had so often gone to pray for the needs of the world. This fitting memorial was dedicated on Founders Day 1972. That same year, Bessie Savage was called to her eternal home. The Maranatha story is one of vision and commitment. Only eternity will reveal the number of lives that have been impacted for the kingdom on these grounds, all because of one man's faith and determination to do something extraordinary. Dr. Henry H. Savage was that man. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. What an amazing legacy. And what a privilege to serve on the shoulders of those saints that stood there before us who helped build this, this blessed ministry. Did you see all of those missionary groups scrolling down? Can you imagine the millions of saints who have come to know our Lord through the activities that have transpired here? And uh, I hope you feel that sense of belonging and sacredness that we have over these many decades. And we just pray that God is going to continue to bless this, this mission to the church and this ministry. And we are now focused more than ever on the ministry of Maranatha at a time when so many Christian organizations are losing their focus and losing their way. We are doubling down on what the founders of this place stood for because the gospel is the same today and yesterday and tomorrow and it is going to go on and we know the end of the story because it will end with our Lord's glorious return. But until then, we are going to glorify him in this place. Amen? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Well, we're going to have a special night tonight. It's a little different from our normal Sunday night program and we're going to celebrate those saints uh, with a hymn sing tonight, old school time. Now, you're not going to see me in one of those uh, ties and suits. Um, praise the Lord that, um, that, that more temperate uh, times have come in the uh, dress area, commensurate with the uh, humidity level in the tab. I love that. Um, but we're also going to have a great testimony um, from the granddaughter of uh, one of our great uh, members here, Paul Johnson. Uh, Claire Johnson will be here and uh, her father, Kevin, they're uh, here, the Johnson family, uh, just a huge part of that history and uh, bringing us to where we are today. So we're looking forward to that as well. This is uh, week five. And with that, I just want to give you kind of the rundown of what to expect. How many first timers here for week five? Just out of curiosity. Uh, there's a few, good, mostly veterans. So this will be old school for you guys. But if you haven't found it yet, the channel, that is the printed program. And you're going to find those at the front desk. Or if you have your phone camera on, you can scan a QR code. There's many around. And you can have a version of that on your phone and know what to do and when to do it. And I will tell you, Sunday's always a great day because it's the Lord's Day. And when it's Founders uh, Sunday, it's even better. But you know what else today is? Can anybody tell me what else is great about this? Sun Dollar, Sunday. Dollar Sundays. Amen and amen. Oh, that's right. So Dollar Sundays over at the sweet shop. Um, you will have to beat me over there. But I'm being much more gracious in that in my role as executive director. I can't, I can't, you know, leap people to get down there first. So uh, rest easy. There'll be plenty of ice cream for all of us. Um, 
We have in the mornings uh, our own Laura Loveberry right here in the center. Laura, whoop, whoop. Laura does a vigorous walk that you can join at 7.15 a.m. And that is a great time of fellowship. And we crawl, they crawl all over those dunes over there on the other side of the channel. And they have a wonderful time of fellowship. But it's a great way to wake up. And it gets you in a great mood to do the next best thing you can do in the morning here, which is actually probably the best thing because it's the prayer walk with Gail Winchell. And that is with our missionary group. So the Youth for Christ guys will be out there at 8.30 uh, for a time of uh, greeting and fellowship. And you're going to walk over to the prayer tower. And I guarantee you it is one of the sweetest times you will have at Maranatha. So I really urge that if you can't do it every day, you'll at least get out there one day to do that. But that is a wonderful time. 9.30 in the morning, we have second cup of coffee with Pastor Ron Clark. And they are having a great study in Joshua on rising to challenges. And I think, uh, again... Uh, pastor Clark is, is sort of our cruise director here, and he's also a great pastor, and he's here to help counsel you and, and to also pray with you during this week if you're looking for that, as are all of us, uh, by the way, and we would love to meet you that way. Um, and then we have the teaching in the Skinner Room at 1045, and that will be with Matt Hurd. So we hope you will join us for the morning sessions. They promise to be great. Youth for Christ with us again tonight after the hymn sing. They'll give us, yep, they'll give us a uh, rundown on all the great things happening here in the West Michigan chapter. And then we're so blessed to have George Murray back uh, to lead us tonight. So with all that out of the way, let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray for this service. Heavenly Father, thank you for parting the skies. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine this afternoon, Lord. Thank you for the fellowship of believers and the great heritage of this place. We want to proclaim your name in the word today, so be with our teacher as he brings uh, your word to us, and just be with uh, Deb and Charlie and the rest as we worship you with these wonderful hymns. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, Maranatha. We're going to do some singing. I have been anxiously awaiting this. So let's stand together. You're, we're going to do this like they did it way back. We're not using words on the screens. We're going to use books. So reach forward, grab a book. If you're in the back, there are stacks of hymnals in front of you. Appoint somebody to go get some hymnals there. There's like 30 or so. So you have no reason to not be able to see a hymnal. If you sing parts, if you grew up singing in the choir and you're a tenor, sing the tenor part, etc., etc. We're going to start with a song that we actually sang this morning. So we're going to, the, this morning was a warm-up, but we're going to do Mighty Fortress, page 333. Mighty Fortress is our God, and we're just going to get rolling. Here we go. Ready? A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal very good okay next one is going to be page <laughs> page eight so turn to page eight when i was a kid growing up in a little methodist church we would do hymn sings like two or three times a year. Mrs. Polari was the, Mrs. Town was the organist, and Mr. Polari, who was a bass in the choir, would come up and lead the singing. And what they would do is he would say, call out a number, and then people would just call out numbers. You'd turn to that hymn, and then you'd sing a verse or two, and then you'd call. And sometimes it was a Christmas hymn, like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and sometimes it was, you know, so I, on the other hand, have already picked them, so we're not taking requests. So page eight, let's sing that. To God be the glory. Here we go. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. 
who yielded his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Big breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Great job. Verse 2, a little bit faster. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. Yes, to every believer, the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives breath. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Amen. I love that. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. What great theology. All right, next one, page 385. Page 385. We're going to slow it down a hair to catch your breath a little bit. Draw me nearer. We're going to do the first and fourth verse. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Here we go. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. To thy precious bleeding side. Verse 4. There are depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. All together. Draw me nearer, nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Yeah, this is live streaming, right? Yeah, I, we may be the only place in the whole country, at least, that's having a hymn sing right now. That's awesome. All right, now, page 61, and as you turn there, I want to give you a little warning. Page 61. This is the most fun hymn to sing ever. So what I want you to do first is I want you to turn to your right, and I want you to give a little stretch, like a, a shoulder rub. It's okay. And then turn around and do it to the person on the other side. Good. We're going to have to stretch everybody's arms up. Here we go, and can it be? Do your best. Jesus loves us anyway. Here we go. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Little faster. Died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued amazing love how can it be that thou my god should die for me amazing 
How can it be, here we go, that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? All right, now, let's just take a moment and recognize how the range of that hymn, we go down to a, a B, a low B, to whatever that, that thou, whatever that was. That is calisthenic hymn singing. Now, let's sing verse 4, and let's try to do a little faster. Yeah, here we go. Three, four. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine. Bold the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own big breath amazing love how can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me amazing how many of you have used the word shouldst before. You just did four times, shouldst. Now, I'd love for someone to tell me what that means, but I think I know what it means, but I've never used it. All right, we're going to turn to page 327. I love the hymn sing. I love, I, you hear me say this a lot, but I love thinking about all the voices that have bounced up in these rafters over the years and how the, the music is in the wood grain. And uh, I love this I love this room. I love the music that we get to do here. And it pleases God when we sing together. Every single time we sing, it pleases him. So let's continue. I'm just talking so I can catch my breath. Page 327. This, you can sit. Let's sit for this one. Here we go, 327. Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in His bosom gather, nestling bird nor star in heaven, such a refuge e'er was given. God His own doth tend and nourish, in His holy courts they flourish from all evil things he spares them in his mighty arms he bears them verse 4 though he giveth or he taketh God his children ne'er forsaketh is the loving purpose so Serve them pure and holy. Amen. Let me pray a minute. Lord, we love you. Oh, we're so grateful for these hymns. We're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who is, is you incarnate. Everything about him showed us who you are. He is sufficient. He is all that we ever need. He fulfilled every longing of every person. Uh, we pray, God, that he would be glorified in this place, in this time, and in our lives in particular. We pray for the children right now who are in the children's program, hearing the word, hearing the gospel, feeling, just getting all the love from all the staff. We pray, God, that you would shape their hearts and draw them to yourself. Maranatha would always be a place that glorifies you and teaches your word and honors your son Jesus in his name. Amen. All right, we're going to close out with a couple that are like classic hymn sings. So we're going to stand back up. We got to, we got to stand back up. Uh, okay, page 550. We're going to do verse 1 and verse 2 of 550. And we're going to do, uh, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus. Here we go, here we go. This is a high F for you tenors. Ready? Here we go. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. 
I see the hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. Here we go. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Okay, let's do verse 2 a little bit faster. Now, you always want to slide. We always talk about don't slide when you sing, but in this song, you can. Okay, you can slide while you sing. Here we go. Ready? Three, four. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He Okay, we got two more. Can we do two more? Do as many as we want. All right, here we go. Page 463. 463. Here we go. You can snap on this. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other side And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there Two. On that bright and cloudless morning from the dead and Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. All right. Actually, we're going to do two more. So we're going to do a song in honor of Maury. You all remember Maury. So we're going to do a song that was his favorite, and he always did when he led these hymn sings. Page 291. 291. Here we go. Verse 1. Wonderful the grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. of Jesus reaches me to three, four. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. 
Awesome! Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise his name. Okay. We're going to sing the next verse, but we got to take a breath. Oh, my word. Holy smokes. Okay, verse two, ready? It helps if you kind of shake like this. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Wonderful the grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. There we go. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn There's men and women. Ready? Here we go. Wonderful, the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. For the world. Jesus, praise his name. Awesome. Thank you, ladies, for bailing me out on that one. All right, last one, page 16. And we're going to sing all the verses of this. We're going to go verse 1, verse 2, chorus, 3, chorus, 4, chorus. <coughs> so don't jump in on the chorus after the first verse. Here we go. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the unions thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Verse 2. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze now let's just sing this gently then sings my soul my savior god to thee isn't that awesome how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Verse 3. And when I think in God his Son not sparing, sent him to die i scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. 
When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sing Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Deb Cresswell. But wait, there's more. Because it couldn't be a Maranatha hymn thing without one more shot at the Maranatha song. So, Ryder, do we have the words up there? All right, you guys get back on your feet. It was just a break to let the lungs rest. Maranatha, Maranatha, hope of all the blood-bought throng. Maranatha, Maranatha, is the theme of this our song. Coming soon, the Savior whom we long to see. Maranatha chimes. Keep ringing, man. Okay, well, go. I, think we're, I think that's good. I gotta let the lungs rest. Now, uh, to, to cap off our, our wonderful Heritage Sunday, we're gonna hear another testimony. Rami's was just so lovely this morning, and so we're gonna ask Claire Johnson to come up and share her story at Maranatha. Give her a big round of applause. Well, praise the Lord. That was wonderful. I loved hearing those hymns, and um, I'm sure my grandpa Paul Johnson would have absolutely loved those as well. Like Chris said, my name is Claire Johnson, and I am a lifetime resident here at Maranatha, um, and today I have the pleasure of telling you a little bit of my testimony and how Maranatha has affected that. So if you know anything about my family, we are big Maranatha people. We joke that we cannot go anywhere around the grounds without seeing one of our family members, which is come to be very true. Um, but Maranatha has been to a second home to our family for years and years. My dad, Kevin Johnson, um, grew up here when my grandfather, Paul Johnson, began bringing his family here in 1968. Papa went to be with the Lord in November, but his legacy at Maranatha lives on through his family here. Just as I'm sure many of you have, I grew up in the church. Now, I need to define that because a lot of people, it means a lot of different things to grow up in the church. I was not a pastor's kid. I didn't grow up going to youth groups or small groups. I didn't attend church camps other than Maranatha, and I didn't even go on missions trips. So you might be thinking, well, Claire, then what did you do? I went to church on Sunday, and I went to a Christian school, but I was never engaged in any of it. My brothers and I would pass notes in church about where we were going to go for lunch and play tic-tac-toe on the back of the sermon notes. Bible classes felt more like homework and I just did not feel like a good Christian. I had such privilege going to church and Christian schools and growing up with Christian parents, grandparents, and family members, yet I still wasn't able to grasp God's love for me. I never had an eye-opening come-to-Jesus moment, as some people do when they encounter Jesus for the first time, so I always felt like I was doing something wrong. 
I felt like Jesus wasn't near to me because I wasn't always physically feeling him or hearing him and feeling his presence, but um, because of that, I felt my faith dwindling. I knew in my mind that God saw me and that he cared for me, but I had no idea what that really meant or felt like. The only time I really felt Jesus was at Maranatha. While home life was never a constant due to divorce and the ups and downs of my childhood, Maranatha was one. I could always rely on coming back every summer and being able to connect with friends, have fun in the children's program, swim in the pool, and grow in all kinds of relationships. I grew up in all of the children's rooms from toddlers through teens, but it wasn't until the teens program that I really started to make my faith my own and understood what Maranatha was all about. I heard countless testimonies from teens leaders, got to worship and spend time in the word and in small groups every day, hear from missionaries around the world, and meet others who were just like me. These people were figuring out their faith, and we got to do that every day together in and outside of class time. Today, I get to call these people some of my best friends, which is incredible that we were able to meet here. But I wasn't in small groups all day, every day of my summers at Maranatha. I got to spend time with these people outside of Children's Chapel, playing lots of games, going swimming, tubing behind the boat, charging way too many snacks at the pool. We went for late night slushy runs, hammocked and looked for shooting stars, and sprinted down to the lake for red flag days like today. I got to spend time with my family by having Sunday night pizza nights at Papa's house like we did tonight, and dollar Sundays like Chris mentioned tonight, so go get yourself some ice cream out by the sweet shop tonight. I made way too many horribly painted jewelry boxes and rocks and wooden snakes at the craft room and begged my dad to make a new tie-dye shirt every single week, even though they all looked the exact same. I got up on stage and performed some terribly rehearsed songs at the talent show and sang my hardest on Friday nights up here in the tab so my family could hear me in the crowd. Maranatha became a second home to me and still is. I felt so connected to God every single summer that I was here as I was constantly surrounded by Christians, worship, God's word, small groups, and incredible people who radiated the love of Christ. I loved getting to dive into... um, God's word and pray with these people as well as hang out and grow in relationships with them every day. But when I would go home, all of that would go away. I felt like I was a horrible Christian because I wasn't as connected to God throughout the school year as I was during the summer. I would fall into the things of this world and my mental health was drastically declining. I thought that God didn't love me because I did things that weren't honoring to him. I thought that my relationship with Christ was tied to the Maranatha grounds, and that was the only place that I could feel close to him. I saw God in so many places around Maranatha and had a hard time finding him elsewhere. This cycle lasted for years, and I did not know how to get myself out of this dark hole. Once I started working here about five years ago and started having deep, meaningful conversations with friends, family, and staff here, I found out that, spoiler alert, everyone's relationship with Christ looks different. I thought that there was some secret to being close to Christ that others were just not letting me in on. I thought that Christ was holding out on me or something. It took lots and lots of conversations, prayers, tears, and faith to realize that Christ was working in and through me even though I was not having physical encounters with him. He works through me. When I teach the kids in the lower elementary room, which is where you might see me most often around campus, that's also where he gives me the most amount of patience with your children. (laughs) He shows himself when I watch the sunsets or stare at the stars. He grants me peace in times of trouble when I gaze upon the wonderful things that he has created. He loves me regardless of where I am, whether that be physically or spiritually. God does not see you at a certain point and view you as untouchable. He doesn't look at the things that you have done and think that you are too far gone. He is never too ashamed of you to love you. He reaches out to you right where you are and loves you right there. Sure, it takes work and faith and perhaps many years to get out of the life that you were living, but God is there to hold your hand every step of the way. This morning I was teaching the kids in the Laurel Room about the Great Commission and we were talking about the disciples going out into the world and baptizing people and teaching them in the name of the Lord. And at the end it mentions, and surely I will be with you even to the end of the age. 
it doesn't just stop with him going and telling the disciples to just go out and do it. He says that he is going to be with them, which I just thought was an incredible connection to what I'm talking about today, that God is with us every step of the way. If it weren't for Maranatha, I would not have been able to make that realization. The teachers I had and friends I made here impacted my faith more than any Bible class or church sermon. The people here have so much to offer, and the community is truly unlike any other. If it weren't for Henry Savage starting this incredible place, I would not have my best friends or the relationship with Christ that I do today, and for that I am truly eternally grateful. Thank you. I was in prison and you came to me. So a lot of our residents, uh, when, they, when they enter into the facility, they go through the intake process, they get into the clothes, they're assigned a room, and then that once they go into the general population, uh, this facility is really good about standards and expectations. As I thought about this experience, putting on the clothes and coming to Jesus, and there's this sense incarnationally of entering into a place like this, not just visiting, but coming in that felt like a powerful mandate out of Matthew 25. When you come into this big place and then it gets smaller and then you go in your room and it gets smaller and it's just you and these walls. Actually, when I first came in and I seen the cement slab, I'm like, oh boy. I don't like the door slamming. It was uncomfortable because I'm in a room with these, with these kids that feel I had nothing in common with. So I was most nervous about that. What are we going to talk about? So immediately you realize that the loss of any kind of freedom is so suffocating. Everybody can tell you what it's like in here, but until you put this sweatsuit on and have to walk in here and can't get out, right? Life hits you straight in the face. have to learn how to be a prisoner. I'm learning that right away, to get my good points, to follow instructions very carefully, to avoid these timeout punishments. I've only had one so far. When they look at you and sort of let you enter into their world, then you feel like you've got an opportunity to talk about what hope can look like. And you realize, again, that unless you deliver the power and message of Christ, these kids don't have a hope in having transformation. Most of these kids, I think there's something missing in the equation, you know? There's no, there's no guide. And I thought this was a really neat opportunity where we could be all things to all people. We could be here, walk in their footsteps, and you know, do some of the things they do so that we would know more what they were going through. Some of the guys say, y'all crazy for coming in here. You don't have to do this. You, you're not getting paid for this, you know? But that's just it. We want them to know that not only the gospel, but people who love and care about you can come into the pods. Even when you think you're in the worst place you've ever been, love can show up. That was May of 2019, and I would just tell you that as I pre-beard watch that movie one more time, it still takes my breath away. 24 hours in a juvenile detention center, not as some ploy, but as an opportunity to live out Matthew 25, where Jesus says in the final judgment, I will judge you based on what you did for the least of these, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick. 
and yes, the prisoner. So in May of 2019, I entered a juvenile detention center in Peoria, Illinois, much like the detention centers in West Michigan where Youth for Christ proclaims unapologetically that whatever a young person has done does not define them, the blood of Jesus defines them. And so for 24 hours, I had an encounter that I didn't count on. That encounter was that I saw the face of Christ. He said that when we expressed, when we fed the hungry, when we gave drink to the thirsty, we were doing it to Jesus. The young man that I saw was a young man by the name of Kamarian Bell. That was his name, but in his face, I saw the face of Christ. This is what Jesus came for. We heard this morning from Dr. Murray that two-thirds of our population has no idea who Jesus is. And we don't have to go 10,000 miles away for that to be a reality. The fact is that this week, we're talking about six miles away from Maranatha in Muskegon Community Schools, a place where there's brokenness, where that same two-thirds of young people don't know the name of Jesus. And Youth for Christ has a vision for our Jerusalem, for the place that God has planted us. Jeremiah 29 puts it this way, seek the welfare of the city where I have put you in exile and pray to the Lord for its welfare. So as you process and pray, as you hear more tonight about Jonah, God's heart for lost people, the story of God, it's beautiful. The fact is that over the last 10 years in West Michigan, 2,200 young people have made a profession of faith because of the ministry of Youth for Christ. And it's not Youth for Christ that has won these young people. It's the power and beauty of the grace of God that we sang about. Amen. It's beautiful. And the fact is that as a part of an organization that is now 78 years old, we believe wholeheartedly and with all of our heart that God is still working with young people across this country and around the world. And that doesn't start somewhere remotely. It starts in our backyard. And we would love to start what we call City Life, which is a holistic ministry that works with marginalized young people, often young people who are overlooked. Does that sound like Matthew 25 to you? It's the heart of Jesus, six miles from this place. So that's our vision this week. We simply are going to present the mission of Youth for Christ and tell you that we believe God is doing something special in West Michigan and across this country. Uh, I'll never forget May 2019 because in the face of a young man named Kamarian Bell, I saw the face of Jesus. And I will never forget that in that face, I saw what Jesus saw in Luke 15, verse 20. While he was still a long way off, the father saw that prodigal son. He felt compassion for him. He ran to him. He embraced him and he kissed him as his Son, may we be courageous enough to do the very same thing by God's grace. Thank you. Let's pray right now for uh, Youth for Christ. Would you bow in prayer with me? Lord, Lord of the nations, we pray, we praise you for the 2,200 young people who have committed their lives to Christ through the ministry of Youth for Christ in Western Michigan. And we pray that you will help them in their walk with you. We pray for many more, and we pray that this week you would use this group of people gathered here to have a major impact on what Youth for Christ is doing here. And we pray that what they're doing will be a challenge to our hearts as to what we can do even in our own backyards. And as we turn to your word again tonight, we pray that you would be our teacher, that you would help us to hear, to understand, and obey what your word says. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Right after my wife, Annette, and I got married, we left our home, we left our family, we left our church, we left our country to go to the post-Christian nation of Italy. And we lived there and served there as church planting missionaries for 13 years years. I wonder, is there anybody here tonight that speaks Italian? Would you like to hear a little bit? Just a little, okay. So th this is uh, three verses from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, in the Italian language. Listen carefully, you might, you know, pick up a word or two. E venuto in casa sua, ma i suoi non lo hanno ricevuto. Ma tutti quegli che l'hanno ricevuto, egli ha dato il diritto di diventare figlioli di Dio a quelli cioè che credono nel suo nome, i quali non sono nati da sangue, né da volontà di carne, né da volontà d'uomo, ma sono nati da Dio. Now that was the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 11, 12, and 13. And if you were Italian and you were here tonight and you heard me say that, you would have understood every word because the vocabulary was perfect, the grammar was perfect, but, but, if you were an Italian and you heard me say that, you'd have said, where did this guy come from? That's not the way the Italians speak. So I'm going to give you the same three verses the way an Italian would say it. Are you ready? È venuto in casa sua, ma i suoi non l'hanno ricevuto. Ma tutti quelli che l'hanno ricevuto, egli ha dato il diritto di diventare figlioli di Dio, a quelli cioè che credono nel suo nome, i quali non sono nati da sangue, né da volontà di carne, né da volontà d'uomo, ma sono nati da Dio. Did you hear a difference? Yeah. You know, if you speak three languages, you're trilingual. And if you speak two languages, you're bilingual. And if you speak one language, you're an American. <laughs> oh. And th the only reason I say that is because a lot of people say, I don't think I could ever go to the mission field because I could never learn a foreign language. And it is difficult for Americans to learn a foreign language because we don't hear other languages spoken regularly right around us. But if God puts his hand on you to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to a place in the world where you need to learn their language so that you can communicate the greatest message in the world, he will enable you to do that. And he certainly helped me and helped my wife and our children. And we thank the Lord for the privilege we had of serving him in the country of Italy. There are four churches in Italy today that weren't there when we went because we took the gospel of Jesus Christ there. Uh, this morning, I started a two-part message, which I'll complete tonight, and the title of our two-part message is in the form of a question. What part of go don't you understand? What part of go don't you understand? And the go we are referring to here is the command of God to us, his people, to go and take the message of salvation to the whole world. And that's why we started our message this morning by looking at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 15, where Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone everywhere. And this morning, we saw that in today's world of 7.9 billion people, nine out of every 10 people are spiritually lost and on their way to hell. Two out of every three people have never heard a clear explanation of the gospel. And one out of every three people has no one living near them who can share the gospel with them. Almost 3 billion people right now are unreached 
These people not only don't believe in Jesus, these people don't know there's a Jesus to believe in. These people have never met a Christian. For them, the Bible is an unknown book. The cross is an unknown symbol. Christmas and Easter are not in their calendar. While we wait for the second coming of Christ, they've never heard of his first coming. These three billion people are not only lost, they are unreached. These are people for whom Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again. These are the people to whom God commands us, his children, to go. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, everywhere. This morning, we saw the importance of going by looking at the true story of the prophet Jonah, given to us in the God-inspired Old Testament book of Jonah. Quick question. How many of you between this morning and now have read the book of Jonah at least once? Well, very good. Thank you for doing that very much. So I invite you to look there in your Bible while we read several selected verses from that book. Look with me at Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go, and you'll notice that I've capitalized the entire word go. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. And we saw this morning that Nineveh was 500 miles east of where Jonah was living in northern Israel, and Tarshish was 2,400 miles west to where jo jo Jonah was living. Now, look with me at the opening verses of Jonah chapter 3, where we read these words. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go, and you'll notice again that I've capitalized the entire word, go, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. And you'll notice that I've capitalized the word, the entire word went, because in English, went is the irregular past tense of the word go. Now look with me at Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth. That's a sign of repentance. From the greatest of them to the least of them. Now look down at chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And now, look at Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, let me take a minute to tell you the entire biblical story of Jonah in a nutshell. A Jewish prophet named Jonah who lives in northern Israel is called by God to go east 500 miles and preach to the wicked Gentile city of Nineveh. By the way, I have an entire message I give about the city of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and the message is entitled, Love Your Enemies. And in that message, I quote, numerous, reliable, historical, and archaeological sources which prove beyond doubt that the unspeakable cruelty of Nineveh at the time of Jonah far surpassed anything Stalin did to the Russians, anything Hitler did to the Jews, and anything that Vladimir Putin is doing right now to the people of Ukraine. So God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah deliberately disobeys and goes west to the town of Joppa, which is a seaport on the Mediterranean, where he finds and boards a ship going to Tarshish, which is 2,400 miles west to the, on the southern coast of Spain. And as the ship sails toward Tarshish, God sends a huge storm, and the boat is about to sink. 
The sailors find out that Jonah's disobedience is the cause of God sending the storm, and they throw him overboard. The sea becomes calm immediately, and God sends a large fish to swallow Jonah. Inside the fish, Jonah wrestles and prays for three days. The Lord hears his prayer and causes the fish to spit Jonah out onto the shore. God calls Jonah a second time to go and preach to Nineveh, and he goes. Because of his preaching, the people of Nineveh repent, and instead of judging them, God spares them. Jonah is upset about this, and the book ends with Jonah arguing with God about why he spared the Ninevites instead of judging them. By the way, uh, this morning and this evening is the only time I'm going to dedicate this week to the book of Jonah, but if you are interested, I have a series of seven messages on the book of Jonah that can be obtained through the Columbia International University Chapel podcast website. If you want to find out more about that, I can tell you personally. We saw this morning that the book and story of Jonah is not primarily about a fish or a storm or the sailors on the boat or the Ninevites or even primarily about Jonah, though he does play a major role. The book of Jonah is about God. It starts with God in chapter 1, verse 1. It ends with God in chapter 4, verse 11. And as you start reading the book, God is mentioned by name or personal pronoun 20 times before the fish is even mentioned for the first time. God is mentioned by name or personal pronoun 67 times in Jonah's 48 verses. The book of Jonah is about God. And what the book of Jonah does under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is to contrast contrast the going, loving, seeking, evangelistic, missionary heart of God with the staying, self-centered, self-serving, unevangelistic, anti-missionary heart of man as seen in the person of Jonah. So here it is in a nutshell. When God said, go, Jonah said no. And what I want to do in the remaining time we have tonight is to point out to you from the book of Jonah, watch, the danger of finding and choosing a convenient alternative. I want to talk to you tonight about the danger of finding and choosing a convenient alternative. Look again at Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out, it says preach in the NIV, preach against it. So the word of the Lord to Jonah was simple and clear. Go and preach. And the word the Lord has said to us just as directly as it came to Jonah is just as clear as it came to Jonah. Now you might be saying, well, God never spoke to me like he did to Jonah. I mean, Jonah was a prophet. Jonah had these, you know, personal conversations with God. God told him directly what to do. God has never spoken to me like that. Oh, no? What about Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, where we read these words? In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. And you say, that's right, that's what happened in the case of Jonah. But now look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, which says, but in these last days he has spoken unto us by his son. And what has Jesus spoken to us? Look again at Mark 16, 15, where Jesus is speaking and he says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone everywhere. God said to Jonah, go and preach. God says to us, go and preach. While Jonah's commission was regional, 
our commission is global. While Jonah was called to Nineveh, we are called to the nations. God's word to us is clear. We are to reach the whole world with the gospel. This is not something we might do. This is something we must do. This is not an option. It's an obligation. We are commanded by our Savior and Lord to reach the whole world with the gospel. When God said go, Jonah said no. And now watch. In doing so, he found and chose a convenient alternative. An alternative which in itself was perfectly legitimate. Now, when I'm talking about a convenient alternative, I'm referring to the fact, listen carefully, that many believers, in refusing to do what God wants them to do, and whatever that is, it will always be in terms of his worldwide redemptive missionary purposes, Many believers, in refusing to do what God wants them to do, choose a convenient alternative. I'm going to say that again. When I talk about a convenient alternative, I'm referring to the fact that many believers, in refusing to do what God wants them to do, choose a convenient alternative. And that convenient alternative in many, if not most cases, is a perfectly legitimate activity. And on the basis of that, they seek to justify what they are not doing by pointing out that what they are doing is perfectly legitimate. Now, that was such an important sentence, I'm going to say it again. The convenient alternatives that many disobedient believers choose, if not in all cases, in most cases, is a perfectly legitimate activity. And on the basis of that, the fact that it's legitimate, they seek to justify what they are not doing by pointing out that what they are doing is perfectly legitimate. They choose a convenient alternative. Now, I want you to think with me for a few minutes about where Jonah went and what Jonah did. And to do that, I want us to think about four things tonight. I want us to think about Joppa. I want us to think about the boat. I want us to think about the Mediterranean Sea. And I want us to think about Tarshish. Joppa, the boat, the Mediterranean Sea, Tarshish. First of all, let's talk about Joppa. Is there anything wrong with the seaport town of Joppa? Absolutely not. Joppa was and is a beautiful place to live or to visit. Located on the west coast of Israel, Joppa was built on a small bluff overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. Fresh seafood, salt air, spectacular sunsets. Joppa today is the coastal section of modern Tel Aviv, the transportation, financial, and cultural center of Israel, home of the Stock Exchange and the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. It's the gateway to Israel for tourists and pilgrims, a perfectly legitimate and smart place to live and work. I've been there. Well, you say, Jonah didn't know that Joppa would become Tel Aviv, one of Israel's best cities. That's right, but he did know that Joppa was given by God to his people, the Jewish people, as part of the territory of the tribe of Dan. As a prophet who knew the Old Testament scriptures, it's very possible that Jonah knew the exact place in the book of Joshua, chapter 19, where Joppa is named as a town given to the Israelites by God because Jonah's own hometown of gath Hefer is mentioned by name in that same chapter as part of God's provision to his tribe, the tribe of Zebulun. Joppa was the place to which King Hiram of Tyre floated the huge rafts of cedar and cypress logs cut on the mountains of Lebanon and purchased by King Solomon for the construction of the temple. It was from Joppa that those logs were taken by land to Jerusalem. 
Joppa was an important, good place used by God as a means to the end of building the temple where all true God followers would go to worship. Jonah didn't go to Sodom. Jonah didn't go to Moab. He didn't go to Edom. He didn't go down to Egypt. He went to the beautiful, legitimate city of Joppa. Joppa was used again by God later in the reconstruction of the temple under Ezra. Joppa was the place where Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Joppa was the place where God appeared to Peter in a vision on the rooftop, telling him that the gospel wasn't just for the Jews, but for the whole world. Joppa was the city from which Peter went to Caesarea and led Cornelius and his whole family to Christ in Acts chapter 10. So we come back to the question, is there anything wrong with the seaport town of Joppa? And the answer is no. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about whether Jonah was single or married. But let's just suppose he was married and his wife stayed in gath Hefer when he went west to Joppa on the coast. One day, she goes out to the mailbox on the road by their house and there's a postcard in the mail portraying an absolutely gorgeous sunset over a wide expanse of ocean. The printed postcard caption on the other side says, Sunset over Mediterranean. And in handwriting that she recognizes immediately are scrawled several short sentences. Sweetheart, loving it here. The air is clean. The salt water has cleared my skin rash. The food is great, and I'm sleeping better than ever. Wish you were here. I'll write again when I get to Tarshish. Love, Jonah. And next to his name, a scripture reference, Genesis 31, 49, which says, quote, The Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from the other. Jonah chose the convenient alternative of Joppa. Is there anything wrong with Joppa? No. Is there anything wrong with boats? No. Is there anything wrong with the Mediterranean Sea? No. Is there anything wrong with Spain, which is where Tarshish was? No. Is there anything wrong with Tarshish on the Spanish Riviera? No. When I was a CIU student many years ago, I went to and stayed in the city of Joppa, Tel Aviv, as part of a summer missions trip. There's nothing wrong with Joppa. And because my maternal grandfather was Canadian, our family of, for four generations now, owns a beautiful lake property in Ontario, Canada. And there in that spot, my wife, who's here tonight, will tell you that she and I own and store a boat. There's nothing wrong with boats. And a number of summers ago, my wife and I led a CIU tour group to Italy. And as part of that trip, we took a beautiful boat cruise on the Mediterranean Sea. There's nothing wrong with the Mediterranean Sea. I've been to Malaga, Spain, located on the Spanish Riviera, right across from Morocco. That's where Tarshish was. And I was there once to preach in cooperation with some local missionaries in that city. And I went there once again with my family for a summer vacation when we were living and serving in the country of Italy. It was good and it was right and it was enjoyable and it was legitimate. There's nothing wrong with Tarshish in southern Spain. Let me say it again. There's nothing wrong with Joppa. There's nothing wrong with boats. There's nothing wrong with the Mediterranean Sea. There's nothing wrong with Tarshish in southern Spain. But the point in all those places and activities, the point is that they were not where God wanted Jonah to be, and they were not what God wanted Jonah to do. In fact, though perfectly legitimate in themselves, they were the exact 
opposite of where God wanted Jonah to go and what God wanted Jonah to do. When God said go, Jonah said no. And because Jonah said no, Joppa was wrong. The boat was wrong. The trip on the Mediterranean was wrong. The destination was wrong. Now watch. Joppa, the boat, the sea, southern Spain, though perfectly innocent, legitimate things in themselves were the convenient alternatives that Jonah chose in order to go his own way. Are you following me? And the questions for you and me here tonight, no matter how old or young you are, no matter how long or short you've been a follower of Jesus Christ, the questions we need to be asking ourselves are these. Where does God want me to be? Where does God want me to go? What does God want me to do? And as we stay close to the Lord and submit ourselves to the authoritative teaching of his holy word, we can and will know where he wants us to be and what he wants us to do, just like Jonah did. And the next question is, are we willing and ready to do that? Even if it means leaving home, even if it means going far away, even if it means going to people whom we don't naturally love, even if it means going to our enemies, to people who hate us and who would like to get rid of us if they could. You know, all of us are in genius when it comes to rationalizing our own disobedience and sin. Jonah could have said, you know, there's still such a great need here at home. Somebody needs to be working here to meet the needs here. And that would have been right for him to say. There was a huge spiritual need in northern Israel where Jonah lived and when Jonah lived there. The spiritual need was so great and the spiritual decline was so awful that God stepped in in 722 B.C. through the Assyrian captivity. So Jonah could have said, somebody needs to stay and minister here. Now watch. At the time of Jonah, there were at least two other Old Testament prophets who were his contemporaries and who were serving the Lord at the same time. They were the prophet Amos and the prophet Hosea. Amos was from Judah in the south of the Holy Land, and God sent him to Israel in the north of the Holy Land, which would be like being called of God to go from the state of Florida to the state of Maine. Hosea was from Israel in the north of the Holy Land, and he was called to stay in that same part of Israel. Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh in Assyria. So God was concerned for the people of Israel, and he called two men to stay in Israel and work among their own people. Of the three prophets, God called two to stay at home to work with their own people, and he called one to go far away and work with a different people. So in this case, God called more to stay than to go. But the point is... If God calls you to stay, you shouldn't go. And if God calls you to go, you shouldn't stay. Each of us needs to be where God wants us to be, doing what God wants us to do. It, and it would have been wrong for Jonah to point to the other two prophets as a rationalization and say, they can stay, why can't I? Are you following me? Another way that Jonah could have rationalized his disobedience once he got to Joppa would have been for him to say, well, looky there, a ship going to Tarshish. Why, if God didn't want me to go to Tarshish, that ship wouldn't have been there. <laughs> this is God's clear indication that Tarshish is where I should go. What am I talking about? The danger of finding and choosing a convenient alternative. Are you listening? Can I talk to you just for a minute tonight about the devil? Nowhere in the book of Jonah is Satan, the devil, ever mentioned. In fact, the devil is not mentioned that much throughout the entire Old Testament. 
but we're told enough to know that the devil is always there behind the scenes, deceiving, robbing, killing, bent on thwarting God's plan of redemption. You can be sure that the devil did not want the people of Nineveh to be the recipients of the life-giving grace of God. That is for sure. And the devil has his ships. Now, there's nothing good or evil in itself about a boat or a ship. But just as God can use things and circumstances to accomplish his purposes, so can the devil. And I want to tell you tonight about one of the ships that came into my life at a critical moment. It was the end of my sophomore year in high school. I had already been a believer for years, but it was then that I really began to seriously think about life and death, heaven and hell, time and eternity. Before I reached my middle teen years, I became convinced that there were only three things that last forever. God, the word of God, and the eternal souls of men and women, boys and girls. I was a middle teenager when I came to that conviction. I became convinced that everyone living in the world was in one of two basic and foundational categories. Not rich and poor, not black and white, not gifted and ungifted, not handsome or unattractive, not educated or uneducated. No, the only two basic categories of people that mattered were those who knew the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and those who didn't, the saved and the lost. And I was convinced as a recipient of the grace of God that I was now a steward of the gospel. God wanted to use me to bring people from darkness to light, and I realized that he was concerned about all people everywhere. So I became increasingly convinced that I needed to study the Bible, God's word, and get some good basic training to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, even though I wasn't sure at that point what my actual vocational profession would be. I heard about Columbia Bible College, now Columbia International University, and I went to visit the school from my home in Pennsylvania. And after I met the students and some of the faculty and saw their obvious commitment to the Lord and to his word, I knew in my heart of hearts, this is where I need to be. I went back home to Pennsylvania, and right then, a ship going in a different direction came into my life. Now, I can't really say that the devil put that ship there, but it was there, just like Jonah's ship in, jo in Joppa, and it was definitely going in a different direction than the one I knew in my heart God wanted me to take, and in itself, it was perfectly legitimate. Now, some of you know my life story, and you know I did not do academically well in high school. By no stretch of anybody's imagination would I ever have been considered as a candidate for a college academic merit scholarship. In fact, when I eventually did apply and was accepted as a freshman at Columbia Bible College, I was accepted on academic probation. And years later, I became their president. How awesome is that? My parents at that time were in full-time Christian ministry making a modest salary, and I had four siblings, so money was a real issue when it came to the idea of going to college. So you can imagine my surprise when the head of the music department at Lafayette College, an Ivy League school in eastern Pennsylvania, contacted me, offering me a full-ride scholarship, room, board, and tuition for four years at that Ivy League school. Though my grades were not good, I loved to sing and ended up winning the solo contest at the prestigious statewide Pennsylvania State Chorus. The guest conductor that year was John Raymond from Lafayette. When he heard me sing, he offered me that scholarship right on the spot, full ride, all four years. I told him, but sir, you haven't seen my high school grades. You haven't seen my GPA. And he said, no problem. We get the football boys in. We'll get you in. <laughs> I took the Lafayette application home and began to excitedly fill it out. And then I decided to stop and pray about it. 
The minute I began praying, I remembered how God had been narrowing my focus to those things that really have eternal value. And I remember how I felt the undeniable need to study God's word and get disciplined training for Christian living and service. And I remember how I knew in my heart when I visited CIU that that was where he wanted me to be. So I stopped filling out the application to Lafayette and never sent it in. I could have. And in itself, it would have been perfectly legitimate. And it would have been a lot more convenient financially. Instead of going to Lafayette, I went to CIU, worked in the dining room dish pit, mopped floors late at night, swept sidewalks, washed all my clothes by hand because I didn't have enough money for the automatic washers, and had four of the best and happiest years of my life. So what's my point in telling you this? My point, and one of the main lessons of the book of Jonah is to beware of the danger of finding and choosing a convenient alternative to what you know God wants you to do. After finishing my studies at CIU and before going to Europe as a missionary church planner, I joined the staff at CIU and trained student ministry teams that went out from the school to share Christ in churches and various other places. And one of the students I trained was Chris Thomas who years later became the director of the Worldwide Torchbearers Bible School Movement. One day during a soccer game at CIU, Chris was involved in a pileup of players and received a very serious injury to one of his eyes and ended up in the Baptist Hospital in downtown Columbia, South Carolina. I visited Chris in the hospital and we had a great time of fellowship as he lay there in his bed. We decided to pray together just before I left. So we prayed, and when we did, both of us closed our eyes. When we finished praying and opened our eyes, there standing at the foot of Chris's hospital bed was a nurse, probably in her mid-50s, and she was crying. I mean, the tears were just streaming down her face. We were so surprised. We didn't know what to say, but we didn't need to because she spoke first. She said, you boys are from Columbia Bible College, aren't you? We said, yes. Then, continuing to cry, she blurted out, If God calls you to missionary service, don't disobey him. She then went on to tell us that she was from a fine Christian family in Columbia, and she attended Columbia Bible College at its original downtown location. She told us that one day, through her study of God's word, the Lord clearly put his hand on her for missionary service. She was so excited and couldn't wait to tell her parents. When she did, her mom went ballistic, telling her that that was for other people to do, not her, and adding, besides, if you go to the mission field, you'll never get married. The nurse told us that she began to think about what her mother said, and she started to have second thoughts. Then one day, her mother introduced her to a young businessman from another fine family in Columbia. Though he was a professing Christian and attended church, he was not really interested in spiritual things, but he was attractive and successful financially. They began to spend time together. One thing led to another. And they got married right after she graduated from CIU. She went on to tell us how the next 30 years were, in her words, hell on earth. How her teenage son was tragically killed in an auto accident and how her unhappy marriage finally ended in divorce. She told us how through all that heartache she had come back to the Lord and had experienced his forgiveness and complete cleansing. Then she told us about two other women students who were at the Bible college during the same years that she studied there, and how the three of them often talked and prayed together about the spiritual needs in East Africa and whether God wanted to use all three of them to help reach the people there for Christ. She told us how the two other girls did go to Africa, and though neither of them ever married, they were two of the happiest people she'd ever known. Then she told us their names. Mary Beam and Betty Cridlin, through whom in the history of missions in the country of Sudan, through whom God did an amazing work that resulted in the planning of hundreds of Bible-preaching churches across Sudan. That nurse then finished her story by admonishing both Chris and me with these words. Boys, if God calls you to go, 
please don't say no. Now, in closing our message tonight, I want you to think with me just for a minute about the amazing contrast between Jonah chapter 1 and Acts chapter 27. In both cases, we have a servant of the Lord. In the one case, the prophet Jonah. In the other case, the missionary apostle Paul. Both of them are on a boat. Both of them are on the Mediterranean Sea. Both of them are going west. And both of them are heading for Spain. But for two very different reasons. Jonah was heading for Spain to avoid taking God's message to the unreached. Paul was heading for Spain in order to take God's message to the unreached. In both cases, a terrible storm came up. In both cases, everything on the ship was thrown overboard. In both cases, the sailing crews despaired of their lives. Now, what do these two passages tell us? One thing they tell us is that doing the will of God, which Paul was doing in direct line with God's redemptive missionary purposes, doing the will of God does not guarantee the absence of storms and difficulties. Another thing these two passages tell us is that whatever we do, whether an act of disobedience as seen in Jonah or an act of obedience as seen in Paul, it affects the lives of other people. Other people suffer when we disobey the Lord, and other people are blessed when we obey the Lord. Now think about it. Think about it. Because Jonah was heading for Spain, everyone on his boat was going to die. Because Paul was heading to Spain, everyone on his boat was going to live. Now, I've been a missionary leader for many years. I've traveled the world. I've spent countless hours on airplanes. I've been in 83 different countries working with missionaries. And I have been in some pretty harrowing airline situations where everybody on the plane wondered if we were going to make it. And I don't mean to say this in the wrong way, but more than once when that's happened, I've said to myself, if those people just knew I was on this plane. <laughs> now, I don't want to be arrogant by saying that. But because Paul was doing what God wanted him to do, everybody on that boat was going to live, and they did. Now watch, it wasn't the point of departure, it wasn't the boat, it wasn't the sea, it wasn't the destination which made the difference in these two cases. It was a matter of going where God wants you to go and doing what God wants you to do, all in terms of God's worldwide redemptive missionary purposes. Jesus has told us, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone everywhere. There are still three billion people who are waiting to hear about Jesus for the first time. And let me ask you once more, what part of go don't you understand? And I want to close our meeting tonight with a prayer that I would like to ask all of us to say out loud together. You'll see the words on the screen, and I want us to pray this prayer together, starting with the word Lord, okay? Everybody say it out loud, starting with the word Lord, and, and, and do it like you sang for Charlie with, you know, with some volume. Okay, here we go together. Lord... Help me to go where you want me to go and do what you want me to do, always in terms of your worldwide redemptive missionary purposes, and deliver me from seeking and choosing convenient alternatives. Let's pray. Lord, hear this prayer, we pray, uttered from sincere hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, uh, Chris is going to come and dismiss us, but I just want you to know that that's the end of my treatment of Jonah this week, but it's not the end of my missionary messages. I'm going to be talking about going every night this week. If you don't like that message, then maybe you'll want to stay away. But that's what we're going to be talking about. And tomorrow night, tomorrow night, just a little teaser, I'm going to be giving a message on the Jonah 
of the New Testament. You might want to be thinking about who that might be. And then Tuesday through Friday, missionary messages. And on Friday, I'm going to give everyone here an opportunity to respond to what God says to us this week through this evening series. Applause. Come on, that was awesome. Thank you, George. What a blessing it's going to be. We are excited about this week. Okay, if you are the parent of a teen in the teen program, they're going to meet with you out on the back uh, portico here and give you a little description about what's going on in the program if you want to meet with them. And uh, if you go really quick, you'll beat me over to $1 Sundays. So have a blessed night. Hope you catch a sunset, and we'll see you tomorrow.